Well, good morning, everyone, and thank you, Minister Feetum. Where has he gone to? Oh, he's down there. Thank you for allowing me to feel your very big shoes. As you can see, I'm not that big, but I hope I will be able to feel your shoes. Thank you. So, let's start. I can see a whole room of technical experts here on insurance. So what I'm going to do today, this morning, because being the first speaker, I'm going to take you through a very soft walk and let all the complications be done with the technical experts later on today. So we're going to go for a little walk through time. And my perception as somebody who came to Gibraltar in September 1993, I was alerted to the fact that it's been 30 years and some of my associates were not even born then. And by the way, happy birthday, Caroline. She turns 31 today. <laughs> so I, there, 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 that's me. And I hope I'm not there because somebody mentioned that I do bear a strong resemblance to the one on the bottom bed. <laughs> Thanks, Nigel. <laughs> Part of the planner of the apes. So let's go to the next slide. So what we're gonna, what I'm gonna do, what I intend to do today, is take a walk 30 years down, three decades in Gibraltar, and how I came to Gibraltar, and how I saw Gibraltar from that to that. I'm just exaggerating. That is not Gibraltar in 1990. That's when I came. That was Gibraltar in 1930. I was really fascinated when I saw this picture, so I thought I'll share it with you. Oh, there's live cattle, and there was a race course. By the way, I had the, 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 you know, the pleasure of meeting a 95-year-old lady two days ago, and he told me there was even gardens in Gibraltar. So let's delve into 1990. When I first came here, Gibraltar was just recovering from the opening of the Spain La Linea, I mean the La Linea and Gibraltar border. And Gibraltar was very reliant on the Ministry of Defense. The economy was basically mostly from the Ministry of Defense. Taxation was very high. I remember as a young associate, I was earning 15,000. And then I was told I have to pay 40% of that to tax. Imagine my dismay. Cost of communication. I could not have any meaningful with my family back in Malaysia because it cost two, three pounds per minute. That was a lot of money during that time. And when I went to work in Hassan's, my first day at work, I was introduced to the Telex machine. Anybody remember the Telex machine here? Anyone? Well done. Remember that. And Electric typewriters. The rest of the world were already using word processor. I came from Kuala Lumpur, and we were already using word processor then. And we had to use electric typewriters. I remember doing you know, legal documents, and we had to tip packs and zzz, zzz. <laughs> Remember those days. So it was how I saw during that time. Then came this man. He was elected in 1988. And he recognized, Sir Joe Bosano, he recognized the economy of Gibraltar needs to change. The landscape has to change. He wanted Gibraltar to be a player, just like the model, like Singapore. So, Mr. Bos Sir Joe Bosano actually established the Financial Services Commission in 1989. And that was to provide strong investor protection for banking, insurance, and funds. And he managed to attract the first gaming company to Gibraltar, which is Ladbrokes, he gave them a very good carrot because they have a monopoly for five years. Nobody else could come to Gibraltar then. But guess what? The gaming industry grew, and now we have 30 gaming companies, 15 online, and they employ 1,800 people in Gibraltar. That is amazing. And of course, Gibraltar has no cattle anymore, no live cows. So we need something else. So tax competitive jurisdiction was another of his focus. We had a tax exam regime. 
and we, he was encouraging high net worth individuals to come to Gibraltar. Construction was booming. And, you know, Gibraltar had reclamation. We have common, you know, the two marinas were built. It was amazing. I saw lots of development going through during that period. And in 1996, we have Sir Peter Quarana who came and he wanted something else. He wanted to put Gibraltar on, on, you know, on the global map. And he wanted to push hard for Gibraltar to be recognized as, as if it's a, a single member state and not on the back of UK. So we, he managed to do that because of that particular legislation. So we were able to, to you know, uh, put Gibraltar in that state. And Gibraltar Finance Center was then established with the aim to promote Gibraltar as a finance center. So here comes 2000, this decade, which I find fascinating and I would call it the golden era because this is where all the traffic came. Gibraltar currently have 57 authorized insurance company. Out of the 57, 35 were given the license during that time. UK firms were coming. They were, they were able to gain passport into the UK market. And one would wonder why suddenly they came. Gibraltar. Why did they come to Gibraltar? Because we have a responsive regulator and the solvency margins at that point was as low as that. And the structure that was used to capitalize an insurance company was easy. We had bank loans that put the capitalization through its holding company down to the insurance companies. That is no longer the case because it was simple then. I will talk to you through what happened mid-2000. So there you go, all the people here. I wonder whether you know, we have anybody from Advantage, anybody from Admiral that came during this time. So you guys there, I remember Euroguard. Were you here then? So you see, we attracted lots of people. It was like herd mentality. And then insurance managers came as well. We had Aon, Aon over there. We have Willis Towers Watson, and we have Robus. Where's Robus? I can see Robus somewhere. <laughs> and obviously Quest, who is now being, you know, under the, you know, has been taken over by Artax. They all came because they knew there was, uh, um, you know, money to be made here. <laughs> I would say. There were insurance companies that had to use the insurance management model. More financial innovations and incentive by the government of Gibraltar. I think this is a bit weird. I'm going to go to this part of the room because... <laughs> and, you know, we have the protected cell companies that was enacted on 2001. And we always say Nigel, our Minister for fin Financial Services, he is still the guru for this because his book remained the authority, and it was quoted in the Federal Court of Montana. I'm sure all of you must have heard those who know him. But we've forgotten there's another author to that book. We have Professor Grant Jones at the back of the room. He was also the author, <laughs> the authority as well, that we have forgotten. So protected cell companies came in, Euroguard was then formed, and Euroguard is still here today. And we also have White Rock, and Gibraltar government also um, um, legislated a light touch regime, which is in respect of experienced investor funds. At this period of time, I remember as a, 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 a practitioner, I was kept very, very busy with the incorporation of insurance companies and also funds. So it was a, a golden era, I would say. And then as usual, when there's the highs, there's the low, Disaster struck. Everybody remember the financial crisis in 2007, 2008. How many of you here, I'm sure, you know, Caroline, you probably were just a child then. So the impact was enormous. I mean, look at that. I mean, I did a study and these are the list of banks, financial institutions that collapsed during that time. 
look at that, Lehman Brothers. Anybody still remember Lehman Brothers? Yeah, Lehman Brothers collapsed then. Why? Because exposure to subprime mortgages, CDOs, they were insuring CDOs. And when the housing bubble in the US collapsed, everything was just like the house of cards, they all failed. I mean, Paul, Yvette, both of you, investment bankers, you must have, I don't know whether you remember that time. It was not a good time. And what about insurance sector? The biggest, biggest insurance company, American International Group, AIG, they collapsed as well. They had to be bailed out because they were insuring that. So, you know, it was, it was a hard time. Nations, I mean, do you think it only happened in the US? No, because Iceland went bankrupt due to a collapse of Kelting Bank. All the exposure to credit derivatives and, you know, CDOs, C, you know, sexy products, unfortunately. And one thing that stood out when I was going through my, my, my study on this, a word stood out, deregulation. What was the cause of the financial crisis? And the word deregulation stood out because in the US, they deregulated de the banks. They allow banks. I mean, Paul, I'm sure, correct me if I'm wrong. They allow banks to actually use deposit to invest in funds. And they started doing all these sexy products. So it was a very, very difficult time. Come to 2010, what happened? We learned. Everybody need to learn from what happened during the financial crisis. So change of tide. Deregulation became regulation, regulation, regulation. Because the, everyone, dog, dog friends came in, reform to protect consumer. We need to save the world. I mean, all the regulators in the world were scrambling to find why the financial crisis happened. So regulation came in. Solvency 2 came in. MIFID 2 came in. CRD 4. All these legislation were with the aim to protect consumer and on capitalization. Companies, banks, insurance companies, they all need reserving. So reserving was a very important word. Reserving to protect consumer. So during this time, 2015, the, minister, the then Minister for Financial Services consolidated the financial services legislation because we were busy. Gibraltar was busy transposing all EU directives. And he thought there's so many convoluted pieces of legislation. Why don't we consolidate? And he did not have foresight for 2016 when Gibraltar left, I mean, when UK left the EU. He consolidated that and that helped us today because our legislation currently is aligned, if not equal to that of the United Kingdom. 2018 as well, one of the highs is that during the financial crisis, we have the birth of the cryptocurrency. We have um, Bitcoin started coming through because they wanted to decentralize. They didn't want, they want, they kind of like want freedom to, to be able to, to access the capital market. And they wanted an alternative. What we call, I've written it down somewhere, it's called free market ideology. So this is centralizing. So, you know, that is something that Gibraltar could put itself on the map now. Because in 2018, we were the first jurisdiction actually to put regulations to regulate crypto assets. And then we were also doing the growth of MGA market. My Ashton was very you know, active in promoting the growth of the MGA market in Gibraltar. We have legislation in place. So the, the lows, and now we have this, UK voted to leave EU. Now we come to 2020. COVID disruption and post-Brexit transitional period. But you know what, during this time, Gibraltar being such a small jurisdiction and the government was so willing to, to do anything to stop um, you know, the market from failing. They worked so hard to actually get Gibraltar to be able to continue to have access into the UK market. The Gibraltar government actually did a study 
they found that most U Gibraltar firms write about 90% of the UK market. And therefore, the, the impact on leaving EU wasn't that great because only 10% of the, U the Gibraltar firms write EU business. And therefore, it was imperative for them to get us to be able to continue to have access into the e uh, UK market. There was uncertainties, of course, due to Brexit, impeachment of U EU workers, and also for the gaming companies. They have workers that were coming in and living in Spain. So there were a lot of uncertainties. Oops. <laughs> but there we go. You know, this, these are all the pluses that I think we continue to have access into the UK market that was confirmed by our legislation and device the, the you know the legislative framework in the UK as well. Redomicilation re of EU, EU companies into Gibraltar. We have Clive Dodds here today who will be talking to us about the redomicilation of his the his insurer from Malta to Gibraltar. And obviously we have now the imminent implementation of GAR. And as I say before, what we have today, our legislation, due to his foresight in consolidating our financial services legislation, we now will be able to passport into the UK market without any issue because we mirror their legislation. Consumer duty, operation resilience, regulated individuals, these are the things that we have to do to align ourselves to the UK rules. But all this stems from the fact that the financial crisis that happened in 2008, 2009, which resulted in the fact that we need regulation. We need regulation to be able to make the economy safe. Oh, why do I keep doing that? Okay, what's next? When I was doing this slide, I couldn't decide which, which one to go. Whether will we have brighter days in this decade or will we have a cloud that is hanging over us? <laughs> I leave you all, you know, to think about this. What's the future for us? Impact of alignment rules, more cost to consumers. That's inevitable. If we want a safe environment, you know, we need to have rules. Inflation, we're still suffering from COVID disruption. The war in the middle, uh, the war in Ukraine and the unrest in Middle East. Are we going to be over relying on the UK market? I mean, we heard Minister Feetham who say, something about the captive, the dual captive regime. Will that actually allow us to have you know, business from the rest of the world and not over-reliance on the UK market? Can we have freedom for further innovation because of the fact that we need to align our rules? Gibraltar without frontier. If the treaty, Schengen Treaty were to occur, will there be more opportunities? I mean, we have the regulated individuals regime in Gibraltar. Can we attract people to come here? Because the regulators say we have to have skilled person living in Gibraltar. We have to have people with the, who, who actually have the function holders living in Gibraltar. Can we attract them to Gibraltar? Because we do not have them currently. We are, you know, we are staff of individuals that can hold the appropriate function to come to lift in Gibraltar. Proportionate regulation to allow growth of startups. Responsive regulator. I'm so pleased that, you know, now we have a two-stage application. Let's see what the, you know, uh, um, uh, Christian and Monica will say later on today about this two-stage application process. And also, Kerry Blight, the CEO for the GFSC, has taken initiatives as well to review the service standard. Because I think a lot of us struggle, and you know, especially a practitioner, we, we want things done. We want our clients to get their response. Unfortunately, you know, the regulators sometimes struggle to, to keep up with that. And what about capital requirement? Because the need for reserve and I mean, what do we do? Before I talk about bank giving loans, that stopped when the financial crisis happened. There's no longer banks who are willing to, to lend money. PE firms come into being. 
And what I what I actually found just about a few days ago, thanks Graham for alerting that that Gibraltar changed amended the legislation and uh, for prudential calculation. This is something that is an initiative taken by the you know the PRA. PRA thought that you know firms are over reserving, so now they say, look, you know we're going to try to give capital back to insurers. And they lower down the cost of capital from 6% to 4%. And the calculation of risk margin has also changed. So that is something that we, you know, I think insurers can actually look forward to. I mean, somebody said that the impact is more for life insurers, but the legislation seems to cast across the board. So, you know, watch out for that space. Anyway, that's it. I'm done. Uh, no, no, you're not. <laughs> I'm so thirsty. <laughs>